I need to show you something. I think Jordan Peterson's clash with the University of Toronto back in 2016 has some underground details that cast a very dark shadow on our intellectual and educational class today. Jordan goes into a lot more detail around the gender pronoun debate on campus in this conversation with author Rex Murphy, so let's watch this before we dive into it. I don't know exactly what the cumulative effect has been mm -hmm. on me. I, I don't know how many people have told me, and these are very hard things to hear, it's been hundreds of people, because I, I meet people after each of my lectures, you know, who've told me that yeah. they are still alive because they watched my lectures or because they read my book, or, and then they usually have a good story to tell, you know, about what sort of hell they happened to be in six months earlier and what they did to pull themselves out and how that's brought their family back together or helped them advance in their career or got them out of bed. Yeah. Or when the University of Toronto sent you some military letters uh, that I thought, I've used this word before, insolent, that I thought were against the spirit of a university, that they weren't supporting you, they were actually threatening you. Yes. And that said to me that something is beyond the particular controversy. Something deeper is wrong here, that universities, or this university is, is upside down. Uh, how did you reason that? How did they get there that they could be so completely uh, uh, unaware of their own position? When I first got the letter, the first letter, and, and I know how HR yeah. departments work, they send you one letter of warning so that it's documented, and then they send you another so that it's documented, and then they send you a third, and if you haven't ceased by then, well then they go to the next step, which would be something to do with whatever approximation, determination they might be able to manage. They document you. Yes, yes, and, and they're documenting all their steps, and I told the person who delivered the letter to me, um, who's a person I actually got along with quite well, that it was full of errors and it was poorly written and that they should take it back and write it properly because <laughs> I did. I, I did. know. I followed it. And, and, I know. And because if they were going to do this, they better do it right or there was going to be yeah. trouble. And I didn't mean that I was going to cause trouble necessarily, but that there was going to be trouble. But they didn't take it back, so I read it on YouTube. So, and, and then I did the same thing with the second letter. The other thing too is that they actually did me a bit of a favor because one of the things I claimed in the YouTube video that I made was that what I was doing by making the video was probably illegal. Yes, I remember. The, and their lawyers basically said that it was probably illegal. And so that also helped establish my bona fides, let's say, as a reasonable interpreter of, of the law. Mm -hmm. and, and so it wasn't all bad, although it was extraordinarily stressful that and the demonstrations that followed. Just for the record, there's no explicit understanding that Jordan Peterson did something illegal by reading out the letters because those letters did not contain any confidential information around the students that complained. This has often been lumped together with the accusation that Jordan docks to the trans students that complained to the administration, but there's no evidence to suggest that apart from being denied by Jordan Peterson himself. Since that's out of the way, I think it's worth taking a look at the condescending and almost threatening tone of those two letters that ignited the entire debate. In the second letter sent out on the 18th of October, this is how it phrases Jordan's opposition to using preferred pronouns. And I quote, You have continued to state publicly that if a student or colleague or staff member requests that you refer to them using gender-neutral pronouns, you will refuse to do so, and that you do not recognize the rights of others to tell you which personal pronoun to use when addressing them. Notice the undertone in the language when it says, recognize the right of others to tell you which pronoun they use. Apart from the fact that there's no such thing as a right that people have to make someone else say anything, it wasn't even part of any law at the time. Bear in mind that this was before Canada's Bill C-16 had even passed into law, and there was no explicit provision in the Ethics Code of the university that using preferred pronouns was mandated. Sure, there were broad definitions that protected against discrimination based on gender identity as separate from sex, but no line of law that could be used to compel speech in this manner. 
It was the same with the Ontario Human Rights Code that also could not be used to force Jordan Peterson to use preferred pronouns prior to the passing of Bill C-16, but one of the most egregious incidents around the same time that Jordan Peterson received these letters is an event that gets slipped under the rug too often. Just a few months after Jordan Peterson's controversy in 2016, a separate incident at the Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo exposed just how deep-seated the drive to mandate preferred gender pronouns was in the intellectual class. Briefly put, teaching assistant Lindsay Shepard was once teaching a communication studies class and having a healthy discussion with her students about the use of the pronoun they as singular and how that relates to the gender pronoun debate. She happened to show her students a five-minute segment from a TV debate around the issue that involved Jordan Peterson and women's studies professor Nicholas Matt, and it landed her in trouble with the university administration after a few of her students complained about having to hear alt-right Jordan Peterson's perspective. But what truly made the matter explode into the public sphere was when Lindsay secretly recorded the over 40 minutes that she was practically grilled by her supervisors for showing the clip. Here's a section of that so you know exactly what it reveals about the ideas prevalent in the educational system of Canada and probably even America. From what I could see, it was a very friendly debate. Um, obviously, this person who had an issue did not express it to me. They just went straight to whoever. I don't, I don't really know what happened. So just to give you some context about Jordan Peterson is, he is a, a figure that's um, basically highly involved with the, with the alt-right. I mean, you're perfectly welcome to your own opinions, mm -hmm. but when you're bringing it into the context of the classroom, that can become problematic. And that can become something that is, that creates an unsafe learning environment for students. But when they leave the university, they're going to be exposed to these ideas. So I don't see how I'm doing a disservice to the class by exposing them to ideas that are really out there. And I'm sorry I'm crying. I'm stressed out because this That's to me is so wrong. It's so wrong. It was this audio that sent shockwaves across the academic community and created a split that has still not been closed with people standing on two very opposite ends on what free speech rights truly mean. Jordan Peterson himself jumped in to help Lindsay Shepard, supporting her publicly as well as suing the Wilfrid Laurier University for unjustly targeting Lindsay's reputation and career. And it seems like these ideas that have gotten hold of the academia are bleeding out into the professional sphere, particularly journalism, which Jordan Peterson himself has clashed with. Talking to journalists is the most stressful thing I've done apart from talks at university campuses. Journalism, I, that's a, just to sidetrack that because it's a very good issue. Journalism, I've been playing at it from the margins for a long while. Journalism is very much corrupted. It is not the media in the middle. It, it is in many cases, wittingly or unwittingly, partisan. Uh, it is part of the game that it says it's covering. Uh, journalism is one of the failing institutions yeah. in this society, as yeah. much as universities. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's technological reasons for that. You know, the journalists, journalism as such is under unbelievable pressure from the new technologies, uh, YouTube, podcasts in particular, um, which of course have also vastly expanded what constitutes journalism, and yeah. so journalists are running scared. It's very difficult for them to to find paying jobs. It's, their staffs are shrinking, the newspapers are in trouble. Um, television stations are vanishing, um, and so there's an increasing desperation, I would say, as well as decreasing professionalism among those who still practice, and so some of it's the personal failings of the ideologues who happen to be occupying the positions that ideologues occupy, but some of it's a consequence of these transformations in, in, in communication technology that are so vast that they're actually inconceivable. And I think YouTube, both YouTube and podcasts are, are, are great examples of that. Podcasts even more than YouTube because mm -hmm. YouTube serves billions of people, which is one walloping network. Yeah. But podcasts are maybe 10 times as popular. So, it, and that's all underground. It's interesting because yeah. they don't attract as much attention, you know, or as much, yeah, as much controversy. Um, maybe because they're more siloed in some sense, yeah. but the journalists are fighting a losing game. And, and I think as you fight a losing game, I've seen this happen with corporations, you lose your best people first, and then 
the death spiral begins, and and I think we're seeing exactly that, and mm -hmm. and then that's exaggerated by this proclivity to polarization that also might be part and parcel of the technological changes, you know? Okay. I think I know the reason for that. Journalism as a sense-making mechanism has a critical vulnerability in that it is one of the first things to be compromised whenever there's a large technological shift like this. In the past, we've seen the boom of the journalistic enterprise when things like the printing press, radio, and television enabled journalists and writers to reach millions of people. But now it's the same shifts with social media and the internet that have decentralized into a million different pieces. Everyone with a smartphone is a node in a large journalistic network, giving their input and analysis to millions of more people through social media, while eroding the need and trust in large media organizations that are beholden to their financial and often political interests. And I think even people on the mainstream media have realized this, which is why some of the most popular faces we used to see on television have decided to move on with the times and establish a social media presence. That's where the future is, with people like Megyn Kelly, Chris Cuomo, and Tucker Carlson taking their audience in the millions to their online platform. And what's left of the mainstream media is a hollow shell of what it used to be desperately clawing for attention and only doing its reputation more harm in the process. Five years ago, the world of podcasting as well was much smaller than now, worth just under $10 billion as an industry, but it's expected to see a meteoric rise over $60 billion in the next three years. Everyone knows where the future is in traditional media and journalism, or just being left out in the cold. One of the things that I have watched quite frequently is the way that people respond to being mobbed on Twitter. Yeah. You know, now I've almost stopped looking at Twitter. It's been about three months that I've taken a Twitter hiatus, let's say. I still post, I, I don't even have my password anymore. I send what I want to post to a third party and they post it because it keeps me out of the- An antiseptic distance. That's right, exactly. And, and, and that's exactly the right way of thinking about it. You know, one of the things I've pointed out to my audiences is that there isn't a debate about who should speak on campuses. There's a debate about whether free speech exists. Yes. That's a whole different debate. I know and, and this. Pe people don't understand the difference in the severity of those two debates. Like, if I don't want you to talk, I still might believe that people can talk. Yes. And they can exchange opinions and they can change yes. each other's minds and even if they're different. The argument that's being put forward on the campuses to stop people from speaking is that there is no such thing as free speech. All there is is the exchange of I, of the ideas of avatars who are possessed by their group ideology. Exactly, exactly. And then the logical consequence of that is to refuse to let them to speak, speak because why should you allow the group that you're in direct competition exactly. with to, to have its voice? And so it's, it's the, the collectivists, the identity politics types, it's, it's the very idea of individuality that they're opposed to, that, that they've dispensed with. And, and that goes back to their, you know, to the French, the, the terrible, the terrible, the despicable French intellectuals who, in my opinion, yeah. were responsible for leading this revolution. I think the fundamental thing that I've learned is that you can speak in, in the deepest terms imaginable, if you're careful, mm -hmm. to an extraordinarily wide range of people and that, that, and that that's desperately needed and that hopefully it's salutary. It looks like it's salutary. And, and so that's hopeful, you know, the, the, the counterpoint to the stress of, of the last three years has mm -hmm. been the, my observation of the positive consequences of having these sorts of deep, as deep as I can make them anyways, philosophical discussions, and to watch thousands of people participate as if it's important. That's a revolution that will have reverberating effects across a generation of people. It's hard to imagine any other period in human history where sophisticated philosophical and political ideas would find an audience in the mainstream rather than just a small subset of people capable of engaging in it intellectually. I think ultimately that's a win for democracy because one of the most important things you need for a functioning democracy is a populace that knows and understands how the world really works. That's a population that is much harder to please or fool by the people high above and is capable of keeping leaders in check or voting them out for someone better. 
Jordan Peterson is a vital voice in that regard, having communicated important ideas around ethics and history to young people, contributing to a generation that is better equipped to carry the torch of democracy.